ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. A few words about the League of Women Voters. We are a nonpartisan, grassroots, political organization. We encourage informed and active participation in government, working to increase understanding of public policy through education and advocacy. The League does not support or oppose any candidate or political party. Any person of voting age, male or female, may become a League member. You will find additional information about the League, including the three 2017 ballot proposals, Voter Guide Part 2, uh, voter registration applications, and a brief flyer about our upcoming uh, Meet the Candidates Forum on October 23rd. Membership applications and other information, and other informative material at our league table located at the entrance to this room. Our discussions tonight are about the 2017 first ballot proposal. Shall there be a convention to revise the Constitution and amend the same? We have gathered an excellent panel this evening who will discuss the history and process for convening the New York State Constitution some of the issues that may be reviewed by the delegates during the convention, as well as the pros and cons of convening the convention. Index cards and pens were handed out to the audience members upon arrival. Please be sure to write your questions to the panel members or members and return the completed card to our league members who are among the audience. Audience questions will be vetted and read by the moderator. Our moderator this evening is Ms. Laura Lack Beerman. Thank you, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I know that some people um, think, oh my gosh, I came out to a program on the Constitution. You know, how exciting. But actually, when you get into the issues, it is amazing how interesting it is, and you can really get caught up in the process and how it works, what happened before. And so I'm hoping tonight you'll all come away with an increased interest in education of the, uh, the process, as well as what could happen if we held one. Um, a couple things, as um, um, Eileen mentioned, uh, the League is a nonpartisan membership organization. We do not support or oppose any candidates or political parties, but we do take positions on issues. And I want to state right up front um, that the State League this year has decided that we are in support of this ballot proposal. So um, this program is to be all balanced and we want to pro provide the pros, the cons, and everything, but I just want to state up front that the League is um, supporting the proposal. Um, so the other thing I want to mention is that this is only one of three ballot proposals on the ballot this November. So don't ignore the other two. Um, in the voter guide, which is out on the table, it has a brief description of all three of them with pros and cons of each of them. And the other thing to remember is ballot proposals are on the back of the ballot. We have um, um, uh, talked with the Board of Elections many times and we've gotten them to agree to put an arrow and some graphics telling people to turn over the ballot. But one of the best things you can do to, is remind your neighbors and friends to turn over the ballot, or um, and don't forget those ballot proposals. Um, on our website, the State League website, right on the home page, and our website's real easy, it's lwvny, the women voters New York, dot org. There's a link to a full page of articles on the Constitutional Convention and all of the issues. The articles are in favor of it and in opposition, so it's not all one-sided. We have all kinds of information there, as well as a briefing paper we did um, back last winter on it and a PowerPoint. So if you want more information, there's lots of good information right there for everyone. Um, since there is the program with the, um, the short uh, bios of each of the speakers, I thought I would just skip the bio so we can get right into the program. Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> so the process is going to be that we're going to give each of the speakers 15 minutes to present information about it. Some of it will be factual information, logistics, history, and some of it I'm hoping will be why do you support or oppose it? Because we do have two different um, viewpoints on this uh, panel tonight. 
Um, so each will get 15 minutes, and then I have a couple of questions that I might answer. We'll see how it's going. And then I have the cards that Eileen was talking about. If you have other questions, please write them down, raise your hand, and a lead member will collect them. And um, we just read them to make sure we're not in repetition, just to make sure we keep it moving and talk about a lot of different issues. So um, that's what we're going to do. So the first person to speak tonight will be Jennifer Wilson. She's the Director of Program and Policy for the Legal Women Voters of New York State. Jennifer? Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Jennifer, excuse me. Is it, does this work? Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you clip it to your lapel. Can, is this better or is it the same? No. Yeah, I don't think you have to turn it on. Oh. This one. Nope. It is now. Is it better now? Oh, yes. yeah. Now it's loud. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Jennifer Wilson. I'm the Program Policy Director for the State League. As Laura mentioned, we are in support of the Constitutional Convention, but up until this point, we have been doing strictly education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Put the volume control on that. On which? On the little thing. Got anything to do with your but more so than that, that they know the process of what could happen if we do convene a constitutional convention. So in November, on election day, November 7th, you guys will all be voting on the constitutional convention question. As Laura mentioned, you'll also be voting on two other ballot proposals. If we vote no, that we don't want to hold the constitutional convention, that's it. Nothing else happens, another 20 years will pass, the constitution mandate that this question appears every 20 years, so it will appear again in 20 years. If we vote yes to hold the constitutional convention, during the next election, November 6th, you'll vote on delegates. So November 6th, 2018. These delegates are meant to be just regular people, just like our citizen legislature. They're meant to be doctors and pharmacists and teachers and firefighters. They're just meant to be like me and you. However, these candidates have to go through a similar vetting process that a state senator would go through. So they have to collect petition signatures for the Senate candidates so we back it up a little. <laughs> so there is 63 senators, and for each of the Senate districts, there'll be three candidates. There's also 15 statewide at-large candidates for a total of 204 candidates that will compete for the Constitutional Convention. So those running in the Senate districts will run just like a senator would run. They have to collect that same amount of petition signatures. Those running in the statewide seats will run just like a statewide candidate like governor. So they have to collect that amount of petition signatures. And I won't bore you with the number. These brochures have all of the, the totals in there. So that's really handy. So once we elect these delegates, starting in April, they will convene in Albany. And they are constitutionally mandated to convene in Albany. However, it doesn't state exactly where they're supposed to convene. Traditionally, it's taken place in the assembly chamber. In the last nine conventions, it's always taken place in the assembly chamber. So they use the same voting optics, the same offices, usually the same staff when they hold the convention. In 60, the last convention in 67, the legislature was still going on in April, so they actually had to stop and you know let out, and then the delegates for the convention came into that same space and then started the convention. Once the delegates convene, they actually get to decide exactly how they want to run the convention. Traditionally, it's done really, really similarly to how the assembly runs. So they form committees, they elect someone to kind of head the whole delegate commission, and then they break off into their different committees and they look at the, diff the different sections of the Constitution and they decide what they want to amend and what they don't want to amend. So at the end of the convention, which usually is supposed to end before November so that we can vote on it in 2019, they can package those amendments however they want. In the last constitutional convention, they packaged them all as one large package. But in the three conventions before that convention, they were packaged separately. And some of them were voted up and some of them were voted down. So at the end, the voters get to vote on whether or not we accept these changes. But ultimately, it's the delegates who decide how exactly we're going to package all of these amendments together. So in some of the earlier conventions in the 1800s, they would put out an entire new document. More recently, they've just done smaller changes, so there'll be eight or nine proposals. And like I said, in 67, it was one huge proposal that got voted down. 
the thing that's frustrating about constitutional convention question is, um, you know, usually there's a lot of people who vote either yes or no, but there's an even larger amount of people who don't vote on the question at all because they don't know to flip over the ballot or they just don't vote because it's usually during a local election time like it is this year. So that's really frustrating for us. The candidates are paid the same salary as an assembly member, so $79,500. And in the last two conventions, they actually had passed, the assembly and senate had passed a bill to allow them to collect double pensions as well. So this bill basically said that convention work was considered government work, and as government work, they were eligible to collect pensions for that work of doing the service during that time. And I think John's going to talk more about the 67 convention, so I won't go too much into that. So that would, to collect double pension, they have to pass a law to do that, but to collect double salaries as a sitting assembly member, senator, or judge, it's written in the Constitution that their salaries cannot be reduced, so if there was a sitting member who was elected, they would be eligible to receive double salaries. However, there's a huge uh, possibility for cost savings with conventions, so some ballot proposals that we passed in the, in the past have really saved us a lot of money. One of the more recent ones was passing amendments to the Constitution so that paper bills don't have to sit in age on legislators' desks. So a few years ago, if we put any legislator put a bill out, the bill has to be printed out and put on every single assembly member and senator's desk and has to age for three days. And some of these bills are thousands of pages long. So I believe it was in 2014, a constitutional amendment was put on the ballot to say that, okay, it doesn't have to be in paper, we can put it on a tablet and we can just have it age on the tablet on the desk. And so we save a lot of trees and a lot of money. The cost of the Constitutional Convention, a lot of uh, academics have gone back and forth over what the actual cost estimate is. We have a range, we have uh, predicted a range from about 50 million to 108 million, and 108 million is what it costs for the assembly to run for a session. So it would cost about what it would cost to run at one assembly session. Uh, there's no limit to the issues that could come up during the Constitutional Convention. So basically anything that's in the Constitution could be brought up and things could be added in that aren't currently in there. We could strengthen amendments, we could weaken amendments, we could completely take some things out. I will say that the New York State Constitution is the fourth largest in the nation and there's a lot of stuff in there that is extremely out of date. If you actually go through it, there's some information about an endangered species of pigeon. So this pigeon has been in, extinct for a long time, but it's still for some reason in our state constitution. We've accomplished a lot of great things during constitutional conventions, Forever Wild, SUNY and CUNY, um, MTA regulations, as well as um, some really basic stuff that you wouldn't expect the Blaine Amendment was accomplished during constitutional convention. And we've also had really great proposals put forward that got voted down by voters. So there's definitely a pro and con there. Uh, like I said, the league is taking a pro position. When our board looked at this, we had taken a con position in, nine, in the 97 question 20 years ago. And we looked back and said, okay, well, what has the legislature done in the last 20 years? And they haven't really done anything that we like. <laughs> we wanted to see ethics reforms. We wanted to see voting reforms. We didn't see that. Instead, we saw 37 federal indictments of legislators who are off in jail now and we're like, okay, well, in the past 20 years, we've, we've re regressed, we haven't moved forward. So a constitutional convention is an opportunity to add some things to the Constitution that can really strengthen our democracy. There are some regulations on voting in the Constitution that we'd love to see change. Voting uh, registration deadlines are in there, as well as when you apply for an absentee ballot, you have to have an excuse to do that. That's in the Constitution as well. We'd also love to see Roe v. Wade codified so if changes at the federal level were to happen, we'd still be protected here in New York State. But overall, like I said, we have been taking the pro stance, but strictly so far just doing education and trying to see both sides. So I'm going to try and present in a way that is a little bit devil's advocate, but still um, fair. So thank you all for having me, and I'll turn it over to John. Thank you. Well, first I want to... This has always been a controversial issue, whether to have a constitutional convention. In 97 it failed, in 67 it passed, but the convention was a failure itself, and the amendments were voted down by the people. So it's controversial. There are pros and there are cons, and I'm happy to discuss both sides. Uh, but it's important that you know that you educate yourselves, and that's why I appreciate your coming here tonight, because this is an important issue. 
And it's important that you know what the pros are and the cons are, and you weigh them, and you make up your own minds as to how to vote. That's the, important, that's the most important thing, to make up your minds. How I got involved in this, uh, two years ago, the then president of the New York State Bar Association formed a committee, a special committee, to look into whether, to look into the state constitution and what issues needed to be addressed. What were the problems with the constitution? And we, we did, we went article by article by article. We called in experts in various areas like state finance. Um, we've not done yet. We haven't gotten to Article 15, which is canals. We haven't gotten to the canals yet. Because remember, back in the 19th century, when the Constitution was drafted, the Erie Canal and all those canals were really important, and they needed to be regulated. Do we need it now? I'm not sure. This, one scholar said that the state constitution is a, quote, bloated, disorganized, 52,500 word behemoth, more than six times longer than the US Constitution. But the question is, what are the risks of going forward with the Constitutional Convention? And I'm sure we'll be discussing that. Um, The, the problem with, the Constitution can be amended by the legislature. I think many of you know that. With two votes of the legislature and then a proposed amendment goes on the ballot for the people to vote for. Constitutional convention, the convention proposes amendments and that goes on the ballot. People get to vote on whether to pass those amendments or not. Um, so the problem is the key, the important issues in the Constitution that are not being addressed by the legislature are ones that can be addressed hopefully by a constitutional convention. And I want to cover, with my mind, is the top five issues. And I've been asked to cover court reform. Uh, court reform is an important issue. It's an issue that's been out there for 40 years, and no action has been taken on real court reform. The question is, does anybody other than lawyers care about court reform? Um, actually, it, you should care about it, because what we need to do is make our justice system more efficient, uh, to work better, and these are the problems with our justice system. And this is an order of my importance, uh, not necessarily the bar associations. Um, number one, you all know you can elect judges. Do you know who you're electing when you go to the polls and electing judges? Do you have a way to really evaluate their qualifications? About 40 years ago, we changed the method of selection of our judges on the Court of Appeals, the highest court in the United States. And they're appointed, that they're appointed there's a nonpartisan, a bipartisan committee that interviews candidates and recommends six candidates to the judge, to the governor. And the governor has to appoint one of those six candidates. And I would have to say, and I clerked for a judge at the Court of Appeals when they were elected. Uh, I think the appointed method has worked. We need a nonpartisan commission to appoint our top judges uh, in this, our, our top state trial court and appellate courts, because I don't think the election process works uh, for judges. Um, so that's a big issue with respect to court reform. Number two, uh, we have one of the most uh, Byzantine court systems in the country. So to give you an example, so I don't have all these memoirs. New York City has a civil court and a criminal court. Nassau and Suffolk County have district courts. There are city courts outside of New York, in Westchester, Mount Vernon, Yonkers, White Plains, uh, New Rochelle all have city courts. Uh, uh, there are town courts, there are village courts. We have a court of claims. We have a family court in each county. We have a surrogate's court in each county. We have a county court in each county outside of New York City. There, there's a propo proposals have been, on, have been out there for years to try to consolidate these courts so we, they, 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 they're, they're not all these different courts with all the administration that goes and can save the taxpayers a fair amount of money if we enact some court reform. Another change that has been not, that needs constitutional revision uh, revision of the Constitution is the number of intermediate appellate courts we have before the state trial courts and the Court of Appeals. We here in, in, in Putnam County and in Westchester County are in the, the fifth, uh, the, the second department, the second judicial department. That department is one of the busiest, if not the busiest, appellate court in the country. Why? It covers Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, Putnam, Dutchess, Rockland, and, and Orange. So nine counties. It's huge. There have been proposals to split that into two different intermediate appellate courts. That, that requires constitutional change, and the legislature hasn't addressed that. The final one, which the bar, want, the bar Association to favor, was the Constitution limits the number of state Supreme Court trial judges you can have. 
and we need more. We believe we need more to handle more work in the courts. So that's, that's an area that the Bar Association is focused on, the need for court reform. It's been out there for a long time. And the, my question is, I think you should care about it, but I don't know how many people are going to care about it. What I care about the most that needs change in the Constitution is voting rights. New York is one of the most antiquated voting laws in the country. And that plays out with respect to voter turnout. New York is generally in the bottom four states in turnout, 46, 47, 48. Why? For various reasons. Number one, we don't have early voting in New York. 37 states have early voting. And that includes red states and blue states. Texas was one of the first states to put in early voting. You don't need a constitutional amendment, constitutional amendment for that, but it would certainly help to put that, in, that right in the Constitution. Registration. Uh, we now have, I think, 14 states who have same-day registration, where if you show up with the right documentation, you have to prove your, your title to vote, you can register and vote on the same day. That has increased voting turnout a great deal in many states. Um, and now uh, 14 states have it. And it's, again, if you look at the states, red states and blue states. Uh, California, Montana. Um, we have this, as, uh, as was mentioned, we have the issue of no fault absentee. We, the only way you can get an absentee ballot is if you're sick or ill, or you're gonna, you've got to swear that you're going to be out of the county. Most states have no fault absentee ballot can't show up at the polls, you can vote by absentee ballot. Those are the three uh, areas, early voting, same-day registration, and absentee ballot that, that we need a constitutional change for. Um, the third item that's important is ethics reform. Um, in the last few years, I think we've had 29 state legislatures uh, who have been convicted of crimes. And by the way, it's very bipartisan. You don't have to be Republican or Democrat. Both parties are equally equally there in the convictions. Um, we need ethics reform in the Constitution because the legislature isn't doing it. Um, so that's important. Uh, a couple of other issues. One is home rule. You all live in a town, probably in, in you're probably not from many cities, but from towns. And, and your county uh, here, you live in the county of, of, uh, of, of uh, 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 the, the, we all are concerned, I was a county legislature and mayor in Westchester. We have, uh, unfunded mandates that come down from the state. I think the Constitutional Convention should look at them, whether we should have unfunded mandates. There are at least five or six states that have a requirement that if the state legislature imposes uh, a burden on a municipality or a county to do something, they have to fund it. Uh, that's something we ought to look at, the whole home rule section, the whole home rule section of the, uh, of the Constitution. Another area we should look at is let's get rid of gerrymandering. There was a constitutional amendment a few years ago that supposedly made uh, redistricting nonpartisan. Well, it did, because the legislature ultimately has control. Many states have nonpartisan or bipartisan redistricting commissions to, to create the state senate, assembly, congressional districts. That's something that needs constitutional change as well. I'm going to conclude with some of the cons. So those are some of the pros. That's what the Constitution really needs to, those are, in my mind, the top five items. There are a few others we can discuss during the course of the evening, but those are the main items. The cons, who are the delegates? That's the biggest issue to me. Who are going to get elected as delegates? If you have the same people who are in the legislature, what's going to get done? Uh, who are the delegates? The cost. You heard the cost. The cost is, is very high. And the big concern these days after Citizens United is, is there going to be dark money coming in? There's going to be money coming in that's going to used to lobby the delegates. Frankly, I'm not so concerned about that because there's already lobbying going on in Albany by all kinds of groups, both, both corporations and, both, and labor unions. They're already up there lobbying uh, our, our legislators. So I'm not sure how, how important an issue, an issue that is. Uh, generally speaking, when you look at the history of constitutional conventions, rights have been put in conventions, but very rarely have rights are taken out. And I know you're going to be concerned about rights taken out. In 1938, by the way, Done? You're okay. Okay. In 1938 was one of, one, one of the major <coughs> constitutional conventions that we had. The constitution in the form we have now was, was put in in 1894. There were three constitutions before that. In fact, the United, we had New York State had a constitution before the United States had a, con, had a constitution. We had a constitution in 1777. 1894 was the first major constitution. It put in the Forever Wild Clause. It put in, it created SUNY. Um, it also put in the Blaine Amendment, which prohibited uh, 
funding for religious schools because of anti-Catholic sentiment. But 1938 was a key uh, constitutional convention because it happened during the Depression. So during the Depression, they put in the state, mandating the state to care for the needy, mandating the state to deal with housing and urban renewal, protecting the rights of workers. It put in a collective bargaining right, the right of workers to organize. It put in the right to, to protect the pensions of public workers. Uh, so the, the 1938 convention put in rights that were needed because of what happened during the Depression. I don't think those rights are really going to be threatened coming out. I mean, I'm sure there'll be groups that will lobby against them, but I, I, I just think they're too fundamental to New York State now to be really threatened. The same thing is true for the Verbal Wild Force. I know a lot of environmental groups are opposed to the change in the, uh, uh, to the Constitutional Convention because they're concerned that's going to be taken out. But that, again, has been since 1894, and I think it's settled in New York that we're going to protect the Catskill and Adirondack preserves. So some of these cons are really, are really serious cons. The cost the, uh, and, the, uh, and, and the election delegates. Who are the delegates? And are they going to be the same people who are in the legislature? I just want to comment, uh, comment one thing about the selection of delegates. So you have to run as a delegate. You have to get signatures to get on the ballot. If you run as a party member, you only need 1,000 signatures from the state senators. If you run as an independent, not affiliated with a party, you need 3,000 signatures. So it makes it harder for independents to run and makes it more likely that the Constitutional Convention will be controlled by the political parties, which was the problem in 1967 when it was controlled by Anthony Travia, who was the speaker of the assembly then. And what they did is they, very political, and they packaged all the amendments in one big package. So they thought that they'd get it all passed in one big package, but that, that doesn't work. If we have a Constitutional Convention this time around, really the amendments should be separated out so people can vote on each amendment. And that's the final, my final comment is remember, whatever, we have a constitutional convention, whatever they propose, it's ultimately up to you to decide whether the constitution is amended. Thanks. So I'm gonna use my uh, teacher voice here, and I'm gonna stand because I've been driving a lot recently, but uh, my name is Mike Rubiak. I'm the regional political organizer with NYSET. Uh, that's the New York State United Teachers. And we represent uh, 675,000 uh, union members, and not just in public schools, but also healthcare. Uh, we also represent lifeguards down in Long Island and Rockland County. Um, so we're a very large organization. And last year, we have about 1,400 locals that make up all those members. And then we have a representative assembly every single year where our members vote on different resolutions. And last year, um, our members from 1,400 locals voted to oppose the uh, New York State uh, Constitutional Convention. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about myself because this issue is uh, very personal uh, to me and my family. And uh, I, I grew up in uh, East Chester, New York, so just south of here. Uh, went to public schools. I grew up in Tarrytown now with my wife. And, I got involved uh, in politics uh, for about a decade now uh, down at the University of Delaware. And um, I was actually not a political science major, I was a psychology major, but I got a D in psychology and an A in political science. Um, so I went, uh, I went the political science route. And th they had a great program where they placed me in an internship with Joe Biden, who was running uh, for president at the time in 2007. And just being involved in that campaign, and it was amazing for me, right, because I, I was a unpaid intern, uh, some kid from the college, and, and Joe would make it a point to come in every single day, shake everybody's hand, he knew my name, um, and we did a lot of good work with that campaign, and you know, he obviously went on to become vice president, and then I worked with um, the governor in Delaware, um, for a couple of years, and, and just working in that atmosphere, um, it's very local, everybody's driving American-made, union-made cars, um, and it, it was a really good feeling, and I wanted to bring that feeling that politics can work uh, back to where I grew up, uh, back to East Chester. Um, so I came back home, um, I worked in the state senate for about five years down in the Bronx, West Chester, and uh, up in Rockland, and uh, we did a lot of good work. I did a lot of community organizing, uh, with our locals, and I also went up to uh, Albany, and uh, we got a lot of good things passed. We got a lot of good ethics reforms passed, and we really worked hard. And the, the work I do now, I've been with NYSET for about two and a half, three years, 
And it's, it's really amazing because now I can take those skills and abilities that I learned um, in local politics and really help our own members get more politically active. And it, it means so much to me to see a room like this filled with so many uh, different people in a local community. Um, it just shows that people are invested and we want to get involved and we want to uh, get involved in the political process here. And I, I do want to mention that, you know, I, I do agree that there's a lot in our state that we need to do. I just don't believe that the Constitutional Convention <coughs> is the best way to do that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see as the mix of a Constitutional Convention. Um, starting first with, uh, I, I hear a lot, and I, I've been doing a lot of these uh, trainings around the state about the Constitutional Convention, and the one thing I hear is, this is our only chance um, to pass, whether it's progressive legislation, pass voting reform, pick your issue, uh, but people will believe the Constitutional Convention is the best way to do it. And when we look at the numbers, um, since 1898, um, as John mentioned before, we, we have a legislative process to pass constitutional amendments. Um, and Jim brought this up before when we uh, stopped having uh, paper, where we had to print out bills in the Senate and Assembly, we became paperless. Uh, but si since 1898, we passed over 200 different constitutional amendment changes to our state constitution. In that same time, although it was a lot of great things back in 1938 with a lot of workers' rights and uh, everything that we have today, in, in 1938 they passed six. So ju just you know, 200 versus six, it, it just makes sense to me that doing it through the legislative process is not only free, uh, but it's more effective and we can get a lot more done. Um, since 2013, we passed a, a constitutional amendment to allow more casino gambling. Um, in New York State, we, uh, as John said, we passed an independent redistricting commission, which is actually, uh, they are appointing nine different commissioners who are going to be uh, independent to redraw the lines. And uh, I was actually involved uh, when they redrew the lines in 2010 and 2011 after the census. And as a New Yorker, I'm just thankful that it's not going to be the politicians in the room anymore. It's at least going to be um, commissioners. Uh, doing this, so it's taking uh, it's taking it out of the hands of uh, legislators. And um, this November too, there's going to be three ballot proposals. Um, so the first one is going to be constitutional convention, but the next two are actually asking New Yorkers if they want to change their constitution. So the system is working, right? The first one is to take public pensions away from convicted felons who are elected officials. So I see this as a response to wanting ethics reform uh, in New York State. As uh, John said before, there's a lot of politicians going to jail. Uh, most recently, the Democratic Assembly Speaker, Shelley Silver, who was indicted, and the Senate Republican Majority Leader, Dean Skelos. And a lot of people uh, want to see ethics reform. They want to take uh, their pensions away if they believe that they're convicted, uh, if, if they are actually convicted of a felony. And, we'll be able to decide as New Yorkers if we want to make that constitutional change. So the system's working. And the second one is a municipal land change for the Adirondack Park uh, just up the road here. Again, uh, we cannot develop on our state park plan because that's something that's in our, in our constitution. So to do that, we're, we had a legislative change. And it's basically um, if you they want to build a road, so they want to build a state road through the park, so the same acreage to build the road should be given to another part of the park. Um, my point is it's going to be 202 changes that are approved in the past over 100 years versus still um, six with the convention. So this is a really ineffective way um, to get things done in New York State. The other myth that I see, uh, that I hear people say, uh, this is a people's convention that the delegates are going to be your average person. And uh, the, out of the 204 uh, delegates, there's going to be 3% of district and 15 at large, as we discussed. Um, as Jen said, these can be current elected officials. Um, so Kevin, I love you. Sandy, I love you. But you guys are ready to go up to Albany. And now, uh, if we have a convention, you'll be able to run as a delegate. You'll be able to get double salaries. As, as Jen said, you can also get uh, double pension credits. 
Um, the other thing here is if I want to run a development, and uh, I actually live in Tarrytown, um, so I would have to be, if they decide to run, um, Senator, um, Senator Andrea Stewart Cousins, who's one of the uh, leaders up in the state Senate, who has um, a tremendous following in my district. Everyone loves her. I, I would never want to uh, try and run against her. And I could never beat her, right? Because she has the money, she has the political power, and she has her base of support um, in that district. I would also have to try and beat, if they decide to run, Assemblyman Tom Avenatti. And then as you go down the line, not only is it the senator and assembly person, but where I live in Westchester, it could be the county executive, it could be the town supervisor, it could be a village board person. And actually in the last, let's see if I have it here. Yeah, so in the last convention in 1967, um, so out of those 204 people, 87 of those people held an elected position. So 87% of them. And 60, uh, 80, 87 people, not percent. Uh, 66 of them were had held some type of uh, appointed political office. Um, you know, to be fair, there was one delegate who was a farmer, um, but the majority of these people are going to be the people we already sent up to Albany that we already believe are working on our behalf um, as constituents. So it's not going to be the People's Convention, it's just going to be an extension of the current legislative process and the second legislature up in Albany. Um, the other thing I want to mention, if I do run, um, I'm going to have to figure out how to take time off, right? Because if I want to run a really good campaign, I'm going to have to uh, knock on doors, I'm going to have to make phone calls, I'm going to have to raise money. And with the job I have now, I can't do that. And I have to put food on the table, I just got married, you know, we, we have a, a mortgage, a nice little apartment in Tarrytown, and I need to be able to have a job to afford that. So I can't spend time running for delegate, um, trying to be people that already have a political base, and think that I have a chance when history tells us that the majority of these people are going to be our current elected officials. The, the other thing I want to mention about the 1967 convention, um, these delegates, they appoint uh, leaders uh, that run the convention. So it's, it's presidents, it's vice presidents of the convention. Um, in, in 1967, every single person who ran the convention, and these people, they make up the rules, they decide how business is run, they decide if the bill goes to the floor or doesn't go to the floor. Um, at that time, the people leading the convention was the current assembly speaker, the current uh, Senate Majority Leader, the current Assembly Minority Leader, a former New York City Mayor, a former Chief Justice, and the former Assistant U.S. Attorney General. So you can imagine, again, it's not going to be um, me as a teacher, me as a fireman, me as a police officer. It's going to be our current uh, political class that's already uh, up in Albany. Um, I do want to read something that the League of uh, Women Voters actually did a really good analysis of the convention. Uh, back in uh, September 2016, so last year. And they said that uh, the convention did operate in a very, talking about the 67 convention. So the convention did operate in a very similar manner to the legislature. It utilized similar floor rules, gave the president the power to appoint the leadership roles and delegate vacancies and assembled on a similar time schedule to the legislature. Um, so I really don't see how this is any different uh, from our current state senate and assembly right now uh, that we have up in Albany. The other myth I hear is the delegates would never roll back, as John just said, they'll never roll back the uh, progressive and um, um, you know workers' rights that we have in our state constitution now. You know, I, as I said before, I've worked uh, for the last decade in politics, and I never thought that uh, Donald Trump would be elected um, as president. And now, for me, whether you like Donald Trump or not, we have a Secretary of Education who's running national education policy that does not believe in public education. And she wants to privatize our public schools. And I know that I went to East Chester Public School, and that gave me the opportunity to be here today. And I'm sure a lot of people here went to public school. So these issues have dramatic effects. And we don't live in a bubble here in New York State. We have to fight every single day against these issues and against the privatization movement. <clears throat> you know, what, one thing that we consistently fight against here in New York State is using public money 
um, for private education. So that's charter schools, private schools, and uh, religious and parochial schools. So as John said before, we have a constitutional um, <clears throat> language in our constitution now that prohibits that from happening. In 1967, when they had the convention, a piece that they had that New Yorkers voted on, thankfully they voted it down, was to change that language, which would have allowed that pot of millions and millions of dollars that we put aside to uh, give every single child a free and equitable public education could have been taken. If that amendment passed, then the constitutional language were changed. Um, so th this not only happened back then, but I can tell you, and I, I see a lot of uh, teachers in the room, um, every single year up in Albany, we fight uh, what's called a uh, school voucher tax credit, which will basically do the same exact thing that that constitutional uh, change would have done in 1967. And I gotta tell you, it's, since I've been with NYSEC, every single legislative session, we are fighting tooth and nail up in Albany to stop that bill from happening. And we win every single year because we have legislators that understand what that means. But if we change that in the Constitution, we wouldn't be able to fight anymore. We would have to go through the legislative change or fight for another constitutional convention in another 20 years. Um, the, other, the other myth here, So the other thing I hear a lot about, um, you know, and this is why this is personal for me. My, so my father, um, he worked in the Bronx, he worked in the public schools in the Bronx, and he spent his career making sure that our state lived up to its mandate of providing a free and equitable public education. Uh, due to his work, he receives a modest pension, right? Because he dedicated his career, he could have done a lot of things, but he chose to make a certain amount of money, which was, you know, not a lot, we didn't have a Mercedes or a Benz in the, uh, in the uh, driveway. We were able to put food on the table. Uh, but right now, uh, they still live in East Chester. They, they live on a fixed income. And if the language was changed, right now in our Constitution, it says that we cannot change or diminish public pensions at all. Change or diminish. So if that language was changed at all, my father's pension could be changed or diminished and we, we just got a uh, two-bedroom in Tarry Town, so that second bedroom that was the nursery or the music room or the library is gonna be my father's bedroom and my mother's bedroom because they will not be able to afford uh, to live in Westchester County anymore because they, they're retired. So th this is a very serious issue for me and I hear that we're in New York in the river bubble, uh, the Northeast would never do that. To give you a couple of examples, in 2001, Maine suspended cost of living adjustments for retirees receiving public pensions. So since 2001, they have received a cost of living adjustment. I'm sure a lot of them got a second job. In 2005, Alaska destroyed and just got rid of uh, public pensions entirely for all people who worked in public schools and they created a 401k system. So if the uh, market is doing good, you can have a good retirement. If it's not, it's up to you. Uh, the last thing in Rhode Island, um, they place all new hires and employees with less than 20 years of service and a greatly reduced benefit. All <coughs> hired employees, cops, fire, teachers, everyone. And Rhode Island actually sued the state and said we have a, um, a clause in our United States Constitution called the Contracts Clause. And they tried to win that case by saying, we have a contract, we made a deal, you can't go back on the deal. And that case right now is in Rhode Island Supreme Court and they lost that case. So they're trying to appeal it now, but I don't want to do that in New York State. I don't think we should, I don't think we have to. It would be an affront to everyone who, we, who does public service here, all of our cops, all of our firefighters, my father, and all of our teachers. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And Mike, can I you know, finish up in yep. two minutes? So the last thing I'll mention, <clears throat> Yeah, so the last two things I'll mention, including the $79,500 for the delegates, the delegates can also hire staff, and the convention <coughs> itself needs to hire staff in order to run uh, their day-to-day -day business. It's called central staff. Um, so they help, you know, they open the door, they help with bill drafting. Um, so it's not just the cost of the delegates, it's gonna be the delegate cost with their staff, and then staff to run the convention. And just to close here, and I, I appreciate the time, um, what, what's exciting for me doing this kind of local community political work 
is seeing people run for local office. And uh, we do have a member here, I'm going to call her out, Judy Mira, um, who's running for uh, local supervisor in Carmel. Town board. Uh, town board, sorry, town board. I'm not taking any kind of job away. <laughs> and, and the reason why this is so critical is the only way to make real substantial change is to run for office, whether that's local town board, whether that's supervisor, village board, county board, county executive, state office. We need really good people to protect our rights, not just once every 20 years, but every single year where we're passing good, local, progressive issues, not only on a village board, but up in Albany and uh, down in DC. So I hope you'll join me. If you do want to run uh, for local office, you can see me after, and uh, we can talk about that process. But I'd rather see every single person in here run for local office um, instead of running uh, for a one-shot delegate convention. So thank you for having me. it up so we keep talking about different things at different times. So just bear with me a bit. And I'm also going to switch who goes first answering the questions to try and um, make it a little interesting too. So the first question, John, why don't you uh, take? Um, and I'm hoping all three of you will answer this, um, even though it is in the positive, Michael. If the proposal passes in November, um, many of the procedures and the process for delegate selection, how delegates run, how, because one of the biggest issues seems to be who will be the delegates at the convention. So how do we get there? So if this passes in November, um, we still have time in the spring of 2018 during the legislative session to make changes because most of the um, the process and the procedures for running as a delegate are in the election law. They're not in the Constitution. So what I want to ask each of you is what changes, if any, and just the top couple, would you like to see made to the delegate selection process next spring if the proposal were to pass in November? John, you want to start? Yeah, I think I would lower the number of petitions necessary for an independent to run. Can you guys hear him okay? Yeah. No. 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 Okay, you need to speak up, John, or use I think the we should lower the number of petitions necessary for an independent to run. I think we should, the legislature, they might not be able to eliminate the double dipping. I think that's in the Constitution, the two salaries. Um, and there's also one of the sets of delegates are elected statewide. I don't think we covered that. So there's three per uh, senatorial district. That's, if I'm counting right, 189 plus 15 elected statewide on a, on, you have to elect the whole slate, you vote for the whole slate. Uh, I think they should be individual, individual vote, voting for individual candidates. There's also a question of how you vote for the three delegates in your senatorial district. Can you cast three votes for one person? Uh, and I think that's, that may be permissible now, I'm not sure. So we need to change that. Okay, Mike. The, the one thing I would love to see changed is to take uh, campaign money and take uh, big amounts of money out of the political process. Uh, last year, um, I was involved in a congressional race, uh, again, just north of here, where Zephyr Teachout uh, ran against uh, John Faso. And in that race, everyone was very excited about Zephyr Teachout. She was a very good candidate. Um, the numbers worked for her. There were more Democrats than Republicans. It, it looked good. And the Koch brothers actually came in with tens of millions of dollars, thanks to Citizen United. They ran negative ads consistently. And at the end of the campaign, she lost uh, by 15 points. And um, like Laura said, the, the same campaign finance laws and election laws can be used and will be used in the delegate process. So I would love to see that change before then, but I don't see a way for that to be changed. I wish we could take the money out of it too, you're right, but I don't think it could be done. Yep. Jennifer? Yeah, public financing would be great. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time to make it happen. I'm definitely here what John says as far as petition signatures. The signature qualification Love number Jennifer. is, the signature <laughs> qualification number is ridiculous. It's way too many signatures. Anyone who's run for local office knows that 
you have your base number that you're required to collect, but really you need to basically collect double that because the majority of your signatures get challenged. One thing I do just want to say quickly about delegate selection is it's not necessarily a bad thing to have legislators be delegates. We have some really great legislators that do some really try and do some really great stuff that just doesn't move because the rest of the legislature is unwilling. And having that institutional knowledge from the judge perspective as well is really helpful. Yes, we want farmers. Yes, we want there was a clergyman during the 67 convention. There was also six union officials. There was five teachers. So yes, we want to have those people there, but we do need some people who have kind of an understanding of how to work something like this. The leadership in 67 was heavily uh, dominated by the leadership in the Senate yeah. and the Assembly. I yeah. don't think there were that many legislators actually in the convention. I think the number was less than 30. Uh, um, I was sitting. Sitting. Jennifer, hey, you have it in the Yeah, paper. I do. Uh, at the time sitting, there was 24 judges and there was 13 sitting state legislators. Right. Just, if that's still a significant number out of 86 delegates. Okay. Let's try a different tack. <laughs> Um, and we'll start with you, Michael. Sure. Why do you think the 1967 convention got voted down at the polls? And they, this is something that really uh, scares me. So, so like John said, uh, the delegates decide uh, how it looks on the ballot when they finally uh, vote on the uh, propositions to change the amendment. So back in 67, it was all one thing. So you voted yes for everything or no for everything. Uh, what I'm scared about is what actually what happened in 67 where you put something uh, on there like we want uh, clean air for everybody, clean water, we want ethics reform, and then uh, we want to reform our public school system and take that money and put it into a private charter system, which I don't believe in. So if all those things are on one question and you vote yes for everything, what, what keeps me up at night is everything's going to pass. So we get clean water, clean air ethics reform, and then the public school system gets destroyed. Um, and that's a possibility, again, in a convention process. Jennifer? I love talking about 67, but I also hate it. 67 was kind of a freak in terms of conventions. It was actually, it wasn't the 20 year mark. The Supreme Court mandated us to re-look at our reappropriation process in our constitution. So we, as a people, we did not have a choice on 67. We had to have a convention because the Supreme Court said, New York, you got to take care of this. What was the original question again? I just get so fired up about 67. <laughs> oh, why was why it did it fail? <laughs> so then we call these delegates in, and they are horrible to talk to. They don't want to talk to the press. They don't want to talk to the public. They have committees convened. They don't hold, they hold four public hearings but they push the press cannot come to these public hearings. The way 67 went down was not like any convention we have ever seen before, and if, I cannot imagine that happening again. But ultimately, what it was is what uh, Michael said, that they were just packaged together, and Travis, the other president, thought, oh, the Catholic people, the religious people are going to come out in droves to vote in favor of this, and he was totally wrong. The exact opposite happened, and everybody else came out in droves to vote it down. John? I agree with Michael and Jen. They both uh, put the nail on the head. The pro one problem was they put all the amendments in one big package. And I think generally I'd, I'd be less concerned about people voting for something that they liked if there's something they didn't like. I think if they don't like it, they're going to vote against the whole package. And that's what happened in 1967. I think the thought was that by putting the, book, the repeal of the Blaine Amendment, that's the provision that prevents aid to private schools. It was put in in 1894 to prevent aid to Catholic parochial schools because of anti-Catholic settlement, but it's more than that now. It's the charter schools involved. Yep. Um, so they thought that they would get a big Catholic and Orthodox Jewish vote to come out and vote for all these amendments because they were repealing the Blaine Amendment. Well, it didn't work, and I don't think it would work if you did it again. And then Jen's point is really important. One of the problems with the 67 convention is it wasn't transparent. They didn't let the press in. They didn't tell people what they were doing. They didn't have open meetings. Uh, I think the open meetings will would probably prevent that now. Mm -hmm. uh, so those those were two big problems, and they they were right uh, as to what caused the '67 convention to fail. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Michael, I think you're first on this one. How can we guarantee that things like pensions or the forever wild preserve won't be taken away? Times have changed since these things were put in. Um, so, uh, li like I said before, concerning specifically the, the public pensions, um, 
We, we do live in a bubble in New York State where we treat our workers right. We believe in having uh, public pensions for people who uh, work in uh, public service. Uh, but I gotta tell you, and, and I've been around the country working on campaigns as well, there's a lot of states that are uh, right to work states um, where a lot of the uh, protections we have here do not exist. And I only mentioned a couple of the largest um, egregious cases of where uh, public pensions were changed or diminished. Um, this is happening all around the country and the leaders of our, uh, of our national government do not like public employees. The, Donald Trump has said, I don't believe in unions. He doesn't want to see unionized work. He doesn't want to see people getting uh, anything uh, from the government, from uh, the public. And I'm sorry, what was your second question? No, it's just uh, and the, pension forever wild. Yeah, and, and forever wild, there, there is no guarantee. And even though we got that through convention process, we could also lose that through a convention process. Jennifer? Yeah, I've, in previous conventions, the pension issue, it's never come up to take away the pensions, but I mean, you know, does that make anybody really feel better or sleep better at night? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. But um, yeah, previous conventions, it's, it hasn't come up. And the forever wild, I will say that you know, it's a major concern, but I think that there's so much more to gain with looking at Forever Wild to, to make it easier to do simple things like test the water and make sure we're drinking clean water and so that we can put a road in or just do road work. They can't even do road work in the Adirondack Park without having to amend the Constitution. And that's, that's crazy. That's not safe for the public. John? There are no guarantees. Yeah. I think mean, everything could be on the table. But I think you've got to look at the likelihood given, one, given New York State. Okay, this question, um, it's not my favorite question, but we'll, we'll ask it, but we might change it a little bit. The question as it's written is, uh, who are we starting with? I think it's Jennifer, is it? Yeah, I think so. What is the most untruthful statement the other side has made about CONCON? So instead of doing that, why don't we say what is the um, weakest argument, or what do you think, you know, what do you counter as some of the uh, um, opposite sides argument for um, your position of holding a con con? Somebody else want to start saying things about that? <laughs> the weakest argument for a con Well, the, for, yeah, yes. The weakest In your case, you're supporting it. So what do you think is the, the weakest argument for um, opposing it? that some of these rights that have been ingrained in the Constitution for a long time are really being threatened, are really going to be threatened. Why? Why is that? 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 The weakest, the weakest argument against the convention, okay, the argument against the convention is some of these rights that have been in the Constitution could be, will be taken out. I think that's a weak argument because I think it's highly unlikely that some of these, these rights that have been in the Constitution for so long and so ingrained in New York would be threatened. I don't think New York is the same as Maine or Alaska or some of these other states. Michael? But that's my, that's my question. Um, so one, and I'll just personalize it for just a second, okay. but um, you know, what, what I always like to say, and again, going back um, uh, to my father working in the Bronx, you know, he, he again spent his career protecting the rights of um, students it, that's in our state constitution. So what I always say to people is why, why risk all of those rights for your one issue? Sorry, Jennifer? Um, I don't have a pension, but I will say that both of my parents are retired police officers who like, were at Ground Zero at 9-11 and they love to call me and, and you know, be like, Jen, I can't believe you're working for an organization that's in favor of this. They're going to take our pensions. We work so hard. We put in all this work. And I honestly I don't really have a counter. All I can really say is that it hasn't come up in the past and there have been so many great things that have been accomplished through constitutional conventions and I went to SUNY and I got to save a lot of money going to school and now I get to do this and, and work in favor of voting rights, but I don't think I have a great counter. I think you just, you know, you gotta do what you think is right. Okay, um, this is a real good question, and we've actually had it in the office. It's a quickie, um, but we've had lots of phone calls on this, so I'm glad somebody raised it. Um, and let's see, I forget where we are. Is it Michael? Michael first? Okay. 
Is it true that if you don't turn the ballot over and you don't vote on the Constitutional Convention that it will automatically pass or that it will count as a vote for the convention? So that's, that's not true. And ju just to develop that a little bit, I, I believe that rumor came up because there, there was actually a vote that the uh, Teamsters had in New York State. Um, they're a private sector union, so they don't have the same rights that are in our state constitution. And they had a vote uh, for their pension um, where the way the rules were set up by the federal government, and th this was actually a bill that uh, President Obama passed, a, a Democrat, um, but the, the way the uh, vote was set up is every single Teamster in the specific unit um, voted yes or no for um, dissolving their pension. And if you didn't vote, that automatically counted as a yes vote. So I, I can't say for certain, but that's where I believe right. uh, that rumor came right. from. Jennifer, John, you have anything to add? No, no. that's exactly Okay, right. just stress it strongly that if you don't vote, it does not count as a yes vote. You have to vote yes or no to have that vote counted. So please pass that word because, as I said, we've gotten calls in the office about that as well. And it's all over Facebook. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, here's another one, and I think we're at nowhere. John? Je John? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, can a constitutional convention eliminate the unfunded mandates that cost property owners dearly? Some that come to mind are public employees guaranteed returns on pensions, the Wicks Law, Taylor Law, Triborough Amendment. Unfunded mandates can be addressed. I don't know if all those are unfunded. Yeah. I wouldn't call those all unfunded mandates. Uh, but there are, as I said in uh, my original opening, there are at least five or six states that provide that if the state legislature is going to impose a burden or a requirement on a local municipality, they have to provide for the funding to deal with that, whatever they require. Um, so that's what I'd like to see addressed in the Constitutional Convention. Uh, as far as these other issues, yep. those are laws, and I don't think they need to be addressed in a Constitutional Convention. They could be. Uh, someone could try to put that on the table, but I think we have to be careful, and that's something to keep in mind generally about a constitution. A constitution has to have important stuff in it. Not everything goes in a constitution. Some of it the legislature should pass. Like, I think the whole the section I talked about with respect to uh, uh, games of chance, I mean, that that's really should be dealt with by the legislature. You don't need that in the constitution. Michael? So I will, I will defend uh, public pensions until the day I die. Um, th these, uh, and, and to be clear, these public pensions are going to cops, they're going to firefighters, they're going to teachers who spend their careers educating our children and they are providing a fixed income life in retirement so that my parents don't live with me and her parents don't live with her after serving the public. But, <laughs> but the, the, the one thing I do want to mention, um, I just do want to thank, and we do have someone from the Comptroller's office here, Comptroller Tom DiNapoli does a phenomenal job of making sure our public pension is fully funded in New York State and we have one of the best public systems politics were different from state assembly and state poli and senate politics. Was it the same people, same ideas, same lawmaking process, or if it was different, what made it different? You know, my, uh, <laughs> I keep personalizing this stuff, but my, my grandfather, he was a uh, trolley car driver and a bus driver in New York City, and he was part of uh, TWU in the 30s. And what, what he would always say to me is, he would say, Mike, nobody had nothing back then. So you had a situation where you were in the depression, people were barely surviving. My grandfather actually dropped out of high school to get another job while uh, my great grandfather was actually uh, delivering ice on uh, Broadway in New York City. But they, these were hardworking people and they still couldn't put food on the table. 
This was the birth of the progressive movement. This was the birth of the New Deal. And our current politics today are not the same. We don't have a similar progressive movement that's birthing out of a, a depression. Um, what we do have is our uh, national politics are being hijacked uh, by profiteers. And we need to work on a state level and a local level um, to stop that by running for local office. Uh, I'm going to agree that, yeah, the Depression played a huge role on how 30 went down. It wasn't the partisan freak show circus that 67 was by any means. Um, but I'm going to disagree that we don't have that progressive movement now. I think in light of what's going on nationally, I think we do have a really big boom of progressive attitudes in New York State. And I know I saw that this year when I was at the Assembly, you know, out there doing legislative work. I saw groups I had never seen before coming out or lobbying for issues they had never taken up before. And some of the same groups we had seen before that were lobbying for new issues that they had never done before. So, yes. If, if I can just uh, quickly. Um, so we, we had a special election for assembly out in Long Island uh, recently, uh, back in March, where there, there was an open vacant seat. And uh, one of our members, uh, who was a teacher out there, never ran for office before, she, she ran. And she ran as a Democrat. It was a two to one Republican enrollment advantage. Um, but when we looked at the numbers and when we ran her campaign, when we were knocking on doors, we ran um, her as a local mom, a local teacher who wanted um, clean air and clean water. Uh, we did not run her as a progressive, democratic, liberal candidate, and she won by 60%. And we did not see that progressive uptick that I wanted to see, uh, but we did see by doing the hard work, spending the exorbitant amount of money, and running this person as a union mom teacher candidate, we were able to win that. So I just wanted to mention that. Okay. Well, John? the Depression did pay a very strong influence on the 38 convention, but remember, at that time, the state was controlled by Republicans, too. So they okay. stepped up to the plate as well. To, uh, to remedy some of the problems that, that normal people were facing, like his grandfather and like my grandfather. <laughs> okay, I think we're on to Jennifer now. And if, again, Michael, if a constitutional convention passes, we've gone with that, um, how will your organization work to support candidates to serve as delegates to the convention? Jennifer, you want to start? Well, we are, of course, nonpartisan, so anyone who runs, we won't take a, you know, we won't support or oppose anybody. But what we will do is what we always do, which is our electronic ballot website, vote411.org. So we will have information for every single delegate who's going to run. We'll have who's supporting them, their positions on different issues. You know, be totally nonpartisan. They'll put all the information in themselves. We will hound them down and make sure that they do it. Will they hold true to what they put on our ballot website? I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> Okay, John, Bar Association. Yeah, I just want to follow up on something about oh, okay. the 38 convention quickly, because I just had some numbers here. 70% of the delegates were lawyers, so don't knock us lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> and interesting, the vote, the vote to have the convention was taken in 1936, when the, in the deep part of the Depression. So 38, the convention actually came out with its proposals and they were voted on, but the convention, the vote to have the convention was in 1936. Now to the current question. What was the current question? <laughs> How would the Bar Association, I assume that's who you'd like to say you're representing, would uh, support or help candidates, if the proposal passed, candidates to run as delegates? I think we would look for reform in the way the delegates are elected and try to get the legislature to, and lobby the legislature to make some of the changes we, we discussed. <coughs> Let me say that our committee, which voted for, in favor, it was, it was a very close vote. I mean, it, we didn't, like jump in right and say, "Late, we want a constitutional convention." It was very close, and it was very close at the state bar association level too. Um, so, I think what we would like to see is um, a wide group of people running to be delegates, uh, and they do need some qualifications. Uh, they need to have shown some interest in government and how government works. Okay, Michael. So, I I just have to mention that I it's. It's, it's strange to me that the League of Women Voters would uh, push a constitutional convention and then not get involved when uh, we actually flick the switch and we're gonna need help all around the state electing these delegates. 
Um, you know, like I said earlier, um, NYSET as a statewide organization, we do this all the time. And we work to find delegates, we train delegates, um, we, we teach them how to run for office, we help to get them on the ballot, uh, we, we provide uh, funds, we also help fundraise in other ways, and uh, we, we walk these candidates through the campaign. And next year is gonna be a, um, what we call an on year, where every single senator and assembly person is gonna be up for re-election. So usually for me and our members, this is a very busy time where we're going through the endorsement process, we're bringing people in, we're deciding um, who we're gonna endorse, and then we're working on the ground with many of you here um, to get them elected, to knock on doors, to make sure the mailings go out on time, to, to do the robocalls, to make sure people know this is the candidate, th these are the values they believe in, and we wanna elect these people. And it's, you know, we, again, we have 675,000 members throughout the state that give voluntary donations for political action, uh, for whatever uh, NYSIT decides uh, to do as a group organization. We only have a certain amount of money that usually gets depleted during these on years uh, because we need people like Sandy Galef, we need people like Kevin Byrne up in Albany representing our rights. So you can imagine that that pot of money is gonna be subdivided not only with Sandy and Kevin, but also with three people in each Senate district throughout the state, not to mention the, the uh, 15 at large that we're gonna have to figure out how to run. And one other thing I'll mention, these state Senate races, just state Senate, can cost, uh, and, and I don't wanna blow it out of proportion, but I've seen them cost anywhere from one million to five million dollars per race. So you can imagine we have three races going on in each Senate district if we have this, plus whatever else is happening in the state Senate and also state assembly. So this is an immense cost, this is an immense project, and I'm one person. <laughs> you know, we, we have a lot of uh, members here. We, we only have 600,000 members. This is gonna be an immense project to elect people who are gonna represent our rights and represent what we believe New York should be. Okay, um, John, it's good that you're the first one on this question. Um, if a majority of the legislature is attorneys, why hasn't court reform been done? First of all, I don't know if the majority of the legislators are attorneys. I don't know if that's true. Uh, I think there are people that don't want to see the court system change because they uh, they like it the way it is. It, it, part of that is with left, you know, the inertia of change being people are threatened by change. Michael, do you have anything to add to You know, I, I think that um, in terms of court reform and looking at it as criminal justice reform, um, there's definitely a lot of movement towards criminal justice reform, and I think that work um, needs to be done in the community to pressure our local elected officials. Um, it's not gonna get done uh, through a convention or in the legislature now. We need these groups organizing every day and fighting uh, for their communities and their neighbors. Jennifer. Some of those changes can only be made by the state legislature state law, so you can't really do it. Well, that pressuring their state representatives. Jennifer, you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I have something kind of funny. So in 67, there was 24 judges, and one of the pillars of holding the Constitutional Convention was to have court reform. So at first, they put out all the proposals, oh, we're going to make it so it's easier, we're going to have less courts, we're going to have less judges, and then the judges realized they're going to be taking the jobs away from their friends, and then the end proposal was actually to have more judges and more courts. So. <laughs> Okay, um, this question is getting a little wonky, so uh, just bear with me a bit. I just want to give you a little preface, and then, Michael, you're going to go first on this one. And I want to read from our New York State con uh, Constitution for a minute. First of all, this is how long the Constitution is. You should what all look at it. We have a copy of um, the um, election part, Article um, 2. No, Article um, uh, 19, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Roman numerals, <laughs> Roman all the time. Uh, um, if there is a copy of this on that page on the State League website that I told you about that you can go to with all information on the Constitutional Convention. There is a copy of the Constitution, so if you all want to go look at it, it's there. Is it up to date? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> yes, I believe so. Um, 
Okay, so this is in the um, Article 19 Amendments to the Constitution, and this is if we have a constitutional uh, convention. It said, this is where it says we have to have this question on the ballot every 20 years. And then it says, um, in the case of the majority of the electors voting thereon shall decide in favor of a convention for such purpose. In other words, it passes in November. The electors of every Senate district of the state as then organized shall elect three delegates at the next ensuing general election. And the electors of the state voting at the same election shall elect 15 delegates at large. Are you all with me? This is what we talked about. Three delegates per Senate <coughs> district and 15 at large. Um, and then it says the delegates so elected, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't say how they are elected. Okay? Now we get to the question. It doesn't have to do necessarily with delegate selection, but rather how those three delegates in each Senate district are elected. So I'm going to read the question, and then if you all, I know you guys will understand it, but if anyone else has questions, um, if, uh, we can do it. Okay. Um, a primary issue has been concerns over potential Voting Rights Act violations. Because every Senate district, you get three votes, I mean three elect, three delegates, remember? And the way the law is written right now, because as I just read, that's all it says is how they're elected, is that you would vote for three votes. You'd each get three votes for those three uh, delegate positions, okay? And so there's concern about the Voting Rights Act. Think about it, there's other ways you could elect them. You could each just vote for one. You could each vote for um, you know, right voting, or you could do all different ways. The way it's written in the law right now is that you would vote for three. Okay. The multi-district procedures tend to prevent minority voters from electing a candidate of their choice. If changes to this process have not occurred in the past 20 years, how is it reasonable to expect that they will do the right thing now? So in other words, or maybe I should let you guys, what, uh, whose turn is it, Michael? Yeah. You want to explain what the question kind of is saying, or? Um, I think I'll try. Okay. Um, oh, uh, so uh, if you want me to, I can start it, and then you can respond, or? Why are you asking, so since, since the delegates run under normal election law? Well, since or? people are electing three delegates, there is an argument that if you are only electing one of those three, that minorities might have a better chance of getting a delegate elected. Um, or if, if and, and the Voting Rights Act, which you know the Federal Voting Rights Act was uh, demolished two years ago, three years ago, three, three. Um, so it, it doesn't, it, it's not effective on that anymore. So the, the argument sometimes is if you weren't voting for all three de uh, delegates or if you were doing ranked delegates or something, you might have a better chance of getting mi more minorities elected for those delegate slots. But the law in New York State, which is a law, not in the Constitution, that's why I read you what it says in the Constitution, just says there's three delegates per Senate district. It doesn't say how they're elected. Could you just repeat the actual question? Sure. Okay. A primary issue is concerns over potential Voting Rights Act violations because the multi-district procedures tend to prevent minority voters from electing a candidate of their choice. If changes to this process have not occurred in the past 20 years, how is it reasonable to expect that they will do the right thing now? Can you define minority voters exactly? In that context, that? It could be racial, it could be ethnic, it could be um, uh, socioeconomic, it could be any kind of, um, uh, it could be independent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, did I, I hopefully I explained that. This isn't a question about slate voting, is it? Yeah, yes, it, it, it is. is. Yes. It really is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Michael, do you want to try and tackle it? Start? Well, I, I, I guess what, what the question is asking, what would prevent, um, um, what, what would prevent, um, I'm, I'm just not following. Would it be, <laughs> would it, would it, would it be advantageous to change the New York State election law in the way these delegates are elected 
to um, so that everyone didn't <coughs> select three candidates per Senate district um, okay. to encourage more minority voting. Did I? Does that kind of maybe ask? maybe you need to explain to the audience what the slate is? Well, the slate is the 15 votes. This is for the Senate districts. Okay. All right. So I so just just to just to broaden it up. Um, So the Bar Association and the League of Women Voters 20 years ago opposed the convention in part because of this. That was one of the issues. Right, right. that's in part. Yep, one yep, of the yep, yep. So if that hasn't changed in the past 20 years, how are we, how, how can we expect them to correct it before, you know, in the event we have right. a convention? How are we then expect them to correct it? Okay. Do you want to Yeah, I'll let John. John so go first? Was, uh, okay. Bar Association. <laughs> Context, but um, you guys speak up, John. Th this learning. is this is the issue. The issue that was the problem last time was the fact that you could vote three votes for one candidate, and that would be discriminatory. Or for the statewide slate, you have to vote for the slate as a whole. There's a lot of cases around the country on voting rights where municipalities you don't have voting by district. So if you had a, a part of a city where there were a lot of African Americans. They would be able to elect a delegate or a council person or a city council person from their district because you can only vote for five people like as a whole. And so it would be not five people as a whole, but you can only vote for one person for the whole city rather than divide it up into districts. The way it works in the in connection with the delegate selection is twofold. One is can you can you can you vote three votes for one person? Because that kind of affects minority voting. But the other one is the slate voting, 15 for the whole state. That's probably a more likely a violation of the Voting Rights Act because you can't vote for people in different districts. So if you had you know, a state senate district in, um, or a state, an area of the state that was heavily minority, they could put up a candidate for the statewide office because that candidate would, be, would have to be part of the slate. If, if, it's if, pretty complicated. Yeah, and the slate voting is even different. It, it, that's why I was trying to separate them. But, but the 15 the at large candidates in, in the 67 uh, convention were um, put up by party committees. They Each party put up a slate of 15 candidates. And you just voted for each slate. You didn't ne even necessarily know what names were under each of those slates. Um, that is one of those things that the legislature can change before the next election. The, and one of the concerns, as Jennifer said, you know, the league is trying to show all sides. One of the concerns is, would one of the parties, you know, would the Democratic Party put 15 at, um, statewide all from New York City, and would the Republican Party put 15 um, all from upstate? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, and if you look at, we have a new brochure, Jennifer, hold that up. It does talk about the delegates, how many petition signatures you need in there. And for this statewide, I believe it's 15,000 15, if, you, if you are appointed by the state party committee. So, um, so that's why there's two different ways of getting elected. Um, and you just have to look at each of them a little bit separately as to how they're elected. So, so nothing, just, nothing's changed. Yeah, no, no, no. Could I, I can follow, could right. just follow up, as you said, uh, they can be, because the Constitution doesn't specify right. how the voting will take place, the legislature can require one vote per candidate. Right. They can't split up the statewide 15 delegates into pe people running separately for those positions rather than as a slate. They can do that. They can. But if they haven't done it in 20 years, then it's unreasonable to think that they'll do it in a year. Well, one thing I can tell you is a lot of the legislators are opposing this, and, and um, we, when we've asked them different questions, um, we, we've encouraged, we've been lobbying for delegate selection process changes for years. I mean, forever. We've been trying to change that delegate selection process. And many of the legislators say, well, let's see if it passes, and then I'll consider changes. So they, and I, you know, it, it, it seems a little backwards to me because it might affect how people vote if we had a different yeah. delegate selection yeah. process. But many of the legislators, that's legislators, that is their argument, that they want to wait and see if it passes, and then they'll consider next spring any changes to the delegate selection process. I can just tell you what we've heard. So, 
Um, okay, any other comments on that one? Um, it, it, it just sounds really risky. That's all I'll say. Okay. Anyone else? John, Jennifer? Anybody? I think that's one of the biggest cons, uh, uh, you know, arguments against the convention. I, you know, you asked what the weakest one is. The delegate selection process is the strongest one, one of the strongest ones. Okay. Um, here's a quickie. I think we're at you, Michael. Uh, can the Constitutional Convention remove sections of the Constitution, such as the one on games of chance? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, as John said uh, earlier, everything is on the table if we have a Constitutional Convention. You can change uh, anything and everything. Jennifer or John, you want to add? Yep, except we'll like to vote on it if they do decide to do that. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, there's a question, um, a couple questions about um, staff and offices and um, paid, you know, if all that's paid by taxpayers and if that included in the estimates of 50,000 to 100, I mean, sorry, 50 million to 100 million. So I think Jennifer, we're just starting with you on that one. Yes. And I'll give you guys a rough idea of how many staff were in 67, so you have kind of an idea of how many, uh, how many staff. I will say that usually, traditionally, I should say, the staff that is already existing to serve the Assembly and Senate just gets pulled over to do convention work, and it's pretty similar. So there was about 207 staffers in the 67 convention, which is a lot. That's a lot of staffers. John, comments? Yeah, if, if it passed and they needed a staff, I'd like to see them go to the colleges and hire college students to do research. I'm sure it'll be less expensive. Michael? Um, and they're getting jobs. Well, I, I wouldn't want a college student uh, determining public pensions, but. <laughs> no, they're not going to determine anything. They're going to do research. It's research. Not, they're not making decisions. So I, I did, because um, that, you know, I'm, I'm always debating about the cost, so I, I just did kind of a conservative cost analysis, but considering 79500 for the 204 delegates, let's say they get three staff uh, per delegate um, and 50 central staff, so that's much less than uh, Jennifer just said. Um, just, just doing simple math, that's about $65 million in salary alone, and then you have to add in the uh, pension benefits that everybody will get after that. Um, and then if you add in location, the materials, everything else, and you know, I, I do want to be clear, in, in 67 they did use the assembly chamber, but the language is unclear where they could rent a space, they don't have to use the assembly chamber. And the language in the Constitution now says that the um, the, the delegates can decide um, how many staff they need, and that's pretty much it. So they determine uh, how to figure out the staff. So, I mean, it's at least $100 million with the staff, with the location, with everything else, in my estimation. That's what I thought you were saying. Just one yep. thing about the pensions is if they want to get that double pension dip, they have to pass a law ahead of the convention. That's not in the Constitution. They would have to go ahead and do that ahead. John? I'll just read what the, what the Article 19 says. Article 19 says the convention shall have the power to appoint such officers, employees, and assistants as it may deem necessary, and fix their compensation, and to provide for the printing of its documents, journal proceedings, and other expenses of said convention. The convention shall determine the rules of its own proceedings, choose its own officers, and be the judge of the election, returns, and qualifications of its members. Pretty broad. So okay. that's, uh, they could uh, hire friends, family, anything. Uh, John, and, and we've covered this a bit, but um, why should we spend a possible 150 to 200 million, which is higher than what you all were talking about on a convention, when we can amend the Constitution anytime and infrastructure projects are wanting for more, no, for money, for example, subway improvements, Metro North safety upgrades, et cetera. I'm not going to argue we, we, we need all those infrastructure improvements. The question becomes, do we need to really take a, a look at the Constitution as a whole? As a whole, because I mentioned four or five major issues. There are other issues. I'd like to talk about the education provision and what we could do there to improve that. Uh, so the question is, that, is there a time, and remember that Constitution 
dates back to 1894 with changes in 1938. There will come a time when you need to you know, spend the money, look at what needs to be done to improve a constitution that is bloated, and many parts of it are obsolete and out of date. Uh, we talked about the risks of what might be taken out. We talked about the benefits of what we put in. You have to weigh that. Uh, there's going to be a cost. Uh, but so far, I understand what Mike was saying about organizing your local legislatures, but it ain't working. It's not working. You know, I can't tell you over the last 10 years how much lobbying I've been involved in uh, and others I know to change New York election law so that we're not, so we're like 37 other states and have early voting. We're like 15 other states and we have same day registration. And we're not the 47th state in voter turnout. And the legislature does nothing. The assembly tries, and I grant it, the assembly is dry, but the state senate does nothing. Michael? Um, I'd, I would say that this is a waste of time, and it's a waste of money uh, to have a convention. Um, again, we, we do a lot of work on the ground, uh, lobbying our legislators. Um, they work for us uh, up in Albany, and if we want to change, as John keeps saying, the, the state senate, the three or four people uh, in a room making decisions, um, you will have your chance next November in 2018 to elect out uh, state senators who you do not agree with and elect people who more value democratic values if you so choose to um, want a democratic majority in the state senate. Um, we have that ability every two years and you yourselves have that ability to run for local elected office and I'd love to see that happen. Jennifer? Um, I'll just say the the incumbency rate of incumbents being reelected in our state legislature is more than 94 oh, percent. And I also just want to say that the second ballot proposal you guys will be voting on, it took the federal indictments of the two leaders of the Senate and Assembly to get that proposal on the ballot to take away pensions of those convicted of federal offenses, elected officials convicted of federal offenses. We fought for like 30 years to try and pass that. And it took the indictments of these two leaders to get them to finally be like, okay, I guess we have to put this on the ballot. So it's not easy to get constitutional amendments on the ballot. It is really, really hard. Okay, um, a very different uh, type of question. Michael, I think it's to you first. In regards to public pensions, is it fair to guarantee, say, 8% when a stock market crash and recession is only returning 4%? to everyone's retirement plans. Can a con con <coughs> fix this imbalance? You know, I, again, I see this as a um, attack on workers. And um, I, I think inherently the question um, doesn't really make sense to me. You know, we, we made a commitment um, to people who uh, protect and serve us and, you know, teach our children every single day. Um, you can choose tomorrow. And anybody who's a cop or a firefighter a teacher, they could choose tomorrow to go work in the public sector, get their own private uh, retirement security, and do that if they so choose to. They decide on their own when they start their careers to be capped at a certain salary limit for their entire career uh, because of the guarantees that we have in our state constitution where people can live a fixed income uh, retirement security. We are not talking here about people buying, uh, you know, beach houses and boats and Mercedes-Benz. We are talking about a fixed income, medium quality of life in retirement where people aren't in the Great Depression anymore, where people are starving in their retirement after serving their communities for 20, 30, 40 years. Jennifer, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. In regards to public pensions, is it fair to guarantee, say, 8% when a stock market crash and recession is only returning 4% to everyone's retirement plans. Can a con, con fix this imbalance? The pension clause of the Constitution is really, really simple. So I get feasibly it could. There isn't anything in the Constitution currently that says anything about the percentages or anything like that. So John? I mean, that could be done by state law. That doesn't have to be, to be done in the Constitution. The Constitution guarantees the pensions. It doesn't necessarily guarantee the amount of the pensions. And as far as, Michael, I have to say something. Responsive. There, are, there, are, there are some abuses to the system. I mean, we've all know situations 
where in the final years of their service, people are getting over huge amounts of overtime to bump up their pensions. And uh, you know, there are some abuses. There are some abuses. Why do you believe the same forces that prevent electoral reform now will not be able to block electoral reform in the convention? They might. I mean, sure, that's on the table too. But you know, we could we could try to mobilize and the delegates at least get them to put it on the ballot for the people to vote on. Let the people vote on. Michael, do you have any comments? Um, just to echo John, uh, anything can happen. Um, it's a roll of the dice if we have this convention and uh, everything's at risk. Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's us who ultimately elects the delegates. So it's, if we do vote in favor, if you do vote in favor of the Constitution, it's ultimately your responsibility as a Democratic citizen to vote for these delegates. Okay, and then a, a quickie question, um, and, and uh, we'll start with Michael. Uh, do you know of any plans that have been implement, already implemented by the state to handle a constitutional convention if it is accepted in November? Uh, no, I, um, I don't know any plans. No. Jennifer? No, and like I mentioned earlier, usually traditionally there's commissions ahead of conventions. We haven't heard word of a commission being formed to study whether or not we should have a constitutional convention. So. No, I, I haven't heard anything other than the lobbying work that we've been doing to try and change the delegate selection rules. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I answer that? Oh, I'm sorry. There yes. Is a, <laughs> that sorry, is, that is a problem. There, there, there's no preparation for this convention. If we vote uh, in next year for delegates, what's going to happen in this, in this coming years? There's nothing in the budget. The idea of a commission was a good idea. In fact, Andrew Cuomo's father, Mario Cuomo, in 1997, he was very much in favor of a constitutional convention, and he did establish a commission to do a lot of legwork. And it would save a lot of the money uh, to have a commission in place earlier to do you know, background work, to create rules, uh, to give to the delegates when they're elected. And uh, as, as I think you said, Jen, uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo had put it in the budget and it was taken out in the usual negotiations that take place. I think he put a million dollars in not tremendous amount of money, but at least it would have gotten people thinking about, you know, what would happen if there's a convention, how would it be organized, what issues would they address. I mean, as I said, our Bar Association Committee, which was a pretty, I was pretty honored to be on the committee, there were a lot of, some ex-counsel to the governor, counsel to the state legislature, a bunch of judges, uh, spent a lot of time looking at each article, and, you know, we'll provide our report, but it's certainly not the level of depth that could have been gone into by a commission. Um, I'm down to the last couple of questions, so if you have any other questions you want asked, please make sure you get them on a card and get them up here. Um, so here's another question, and we'll start with Michael, I believe. Um, in the current national political climate, it seems that a constitutional convention might draw too many national big money interests into New York State. What do you think of this risk? You know, I, I said this uh, earlier, it's, it's not a risk, it's already happening in New York State. Um, again, I'm going to bring it up, but in Zephyr Teachout, when she ran for Congress, she ran on everything that every, everybody on this panel was talking about. Ethics reform, voting reform, campaign finance reform, and that scared national interests, in this case the Koch brothers, and we know it's the Koch brothers because we saw after the election when she lost by 15 points, that they filed, and they were the ones where we tracked the money to, where they created LLCs, which are you know companies to funnel this money. Yeah, so her name is Zephyr Teachout. Um, she's somebody who also ran for governor. Uh, she ran against uh, Governor Cuomo in 2014, and uh, she recently ran for Congress in the last cycle. And again, th this isn't just a couple hundred thousand dollars against her campaign. This was millions and millions of dollars every single day leading up to election day where there were negative advertisements on TV, radio, in people's mailboxes that nobody, um, not the National Democratic Party, um, you know, not big uh, groups like NYSIT, nobody can keep up with this money. Jennifer? Yeah, it's definitely a fear. You know, I hate the term special interest because hospitals are special interests. You know, teachers are considered a special interest group. So. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of money that's going to be spent. That money is going to have to be disclosed through JCOPE. It's all going to be public. You're going to be able to see who's spending the money, who's spending it on what candidates. So the money's already being spent. I mean, it's already a lot of money has been spent. But I will say the pro groups, we haven't been spending a lot of money. It's mostly been the con groups who have been spending a lot of money. 
money, money interests are already here. Uh, people are already putting money into races in New York State and dealing with issues, so it's nothing new. But you know, we do have people on the other side of the Koch brothers who give a lot of money for, uh, for progressive causes. Michael? So I'd, I would love to see um, ethics reform, uh, voting reform, so we can have early voting, um, and we can actually register um, day of the election if we wanted to, instead of a year ahead of time. And um, education, I'd, I'd like to see uh, the education formula um, changed and uh, mandated into our state constitution so we don't have to uh, deal with these issues every single year. But we can do that through a uh, legislative amendment process with the Constitution. Jennifer? Definitely going to echo what they said. I'm going to add redistricting, which is something that the legislature does not want to touch because it's in their favor right now. So I would love to see redistricting taken up at a convention. Can I make a comment about education? I think that was a really good point, Michael. Okay. I mean, you look Can at you the, speak up, though, John? the education articles. It's a small article, Article 11. It says, the legislature shall provide for the maintenance and support of a system of the common schools wherein all the children of the state may be educated. And the big issue is financial equality. And you know, there's been a lawsuit, as many of you are teachers may know, the campaign for physical equity. That lawsuit's been dragging on for years to make sure that education funding is fair throughout the state uh, and students are treated fairly. I do think the Constitution should be amended uh, to provide for some formula, fair formula for funding for education. Um, and I think, you know, I also think we should consider expanding it to include at least junior colleges, free education in junior colleges. Okay, I've gone through all the questions. Community, so I just thought, community colleges. I, I just thought I'd give each of you just a couple of minutes to kind of summarize what you'd like to people to have as a takeaway tonight, and let's do a reverse order. Michael, you want to start? Sure. Um, and again, I'll stand up here, but um, I'll, I'll be very quick and succinct. But like I said before, um, why should we risk everything? that's in our state constitution for your one issue. Um, we've been working again very successfully with our local elected officials to work and lobby on our behalf up at Albany. Um, I'm sure uh, Sandy and Kevin can attest to that. And we will continue to do that work. But again, the democracy takes people and it takes involvement and everybody staying involved, not just coming to this meeting today, but Think about really running for local office. Um, we, we have a luxury in New York State where there's so many different offices we can run for, whether it's village, town, um, you know, county, our state offices. Um, you can pick your list. Uh, but I really want to see um, activism and people getting more involved locally instead of taking a sledgehammer um, to our state constitution, throwing everything out, and putting everything that not only I fight for on a daily basis, but a lot of people in this room uh, fight for, uh, for not only their careers, but their families have fought for uh, for generations. Thank you. Yeah. Michael said there's a danger of throwing everything yeah, speak out. Up, John. There's a danger of throwing everything out for one issue. It's not just one issue. As we saw, there are multiple problems with the Constitution. The thing is, is that people who have one issue are opposed to it. And the issues that have been raised with concern about public pensions, the right for collective bargaining, the, uh, the issue with the forever wild clause, I don't think there's a real risk there. And I think the benefits of going forward to look at the Constitution as a whole and all the problems we talked about with the Constitution outweigh the risks of rights being taken out of the Constitution. Um, but there are problems. The delicate selection process is a major pro problem, and the cost is a major problem. And the possibility of money coming in affecting the delegates, or, though I think that we have a transparent, open process that will help diminish the effect of money. But the important thing is, is that you, you listen to us, do more reading, get educated as to the issues, and vote what you think is the right way to go. I always like to conclude some of these things with, uh, with the fact that this is a democracy and this is part of the democratic process. And uh, Robert Hutchins, who was the uh, president of the University of Chicago, once said, the death of democracy is not likely to be an assassination by ambush, but a slow extinction from indifference, uh, apathy, and undernourishment. 
And the fact that you're here shows that that's wrong. So please get out there and tell people about this book. By the way, the assassination by ambush, I'm a little worried about now, that now because of what's going on in Washington. Right? <laughs> but anyway, thank you all for listening.